Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here at the OG Command Center with my friend and colleague, the intrepid Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And Benny, the engineer, videographer extraordinaire, is with us as well. We thank you for watching and listening. want to remind everyone before we get started, if you like our show, please subscribe to our video channel on YouTube. Please subscribe to our audio podcast. We're on Apple, Google, Spotify. Uh, we appreciate your subs, following us on social media, uh, spread the word. It's really helpful. And I also want to remind audiences that um, if, you, if you primarily listen to our audio podcast, we have some video exclusives. Uh, Bernie's doing these quick hitter episodes that we don't necessarily upload the audio. So you may want to go back and forth and, and, and see what kind of content is out there. And uh, at the same time, for our uh, video audience members, keep in mind, we recorded uh, audio versions of this podcast for, what, three years before we, we set up the video show. So we have an extensive We had over, over 50. Yeah, we, yeah, there are quite a few episodes that are audio only. Some of them we have been uh, uploading to the video channel as, as kind of like greatest hits. But there are a lot of episodes that probably will will remain just in in the audio catalog, and so uh, you may want to to check out and, and cross over because uh, you know there's some content only audio, some content only video. So anyhow, thanks for watching, thanks for listening. Uh, we have a Philly episode today. That's usually a popular topic, and uh, we're going to look at what's going on in terms of politics in the uh, underworld, Philadelphia underworld, uh, some people going into prison, some people coming out. And so Scott's going to bring us up to date on the, the administration and just some other things Philly yeah, related. Like, you know, some house housekeeping notes and kind of where we stand in the summer of 2023 with the pecking order there, as Jimmy said, uh, Stevie Mazzone and Dom Grande, who were two major shot callers in this crime family uh, reported to prison uh, in, in the late winter, early spring of this year. And uh, that means there are slots to be filled. And at the same time that they were going into prison, um, the person that I, I think is going to be the focus of this episode was coming out of prison. And I think we might call this episode, you know, the mouse is back in the house. <laughs> uh, Joe mouse or mousy uh, Massimino. Came out after doing 12 years uh, in, in January and is either finishing up um, his time in a halfway house or is uh, already out of the halfway house. But um, he was an underboss for this uh, Bruno Scarfo crime family back in the 2000s. And it looks like he will be returning to that post uh, soon based on what, what we're hearing in South Philly. So he was under boss under uh, Uncle, Uncle Joe. Yeah, Legambi. When when those other guys were in prison right. the first time they were. When they the Merlino Mazzone crew, Borghese, uh, when that when that triumvirate uh, went away in, in around 2000 and they were all locked up uh, through, through that, most of that decade of the 2000s. Uh, yeah, Joe, Joe Mouse stepped up to the number two spot. You know, he's, he's a... Uh, you know, it's a rags to riches kind of mob story. Uh, he, he was just a bartender and a bookie in New Jersey when he started. And I don't think anybody foresaw uh, Joe Mouse a, as a, uh, an administrator. But that's how his mob career evolved. And from, you know, talking to people that are, you know, have their finger on the pulse, he's, he, was, he was pretty good at it back then. And uh, he's got a lot of respect. A lot of people like him. He's he's he scares people. Uh, he's an unapologetic gangster. Um, I think his arrest record is is. I think the last I heard, he had forty eight career arrests. You know, uh, over a half dozen felony convictions. Has done a lot of prison time. He he looks like something out of Central Cassidy, and he's very rugged looking. We've mentioned off air. He's uh, kind of an outlier in the mafia that he, he, he sports facial hair and, and it seems to, to fly. Nobody, mm -hmm. uh, he, he doesn't get um, reprimanded for it, hasn't been forced to shave the mustache, has had that yeah. same mustache for, for uh, a good 30, 40 years. And um, I know in, in New York that probably wouldn't fly. They seem a lot stricter. Yeah. 
about that. But, uh, you know, so Joe Mouse walked out of prison. And from what I understand, he's working a job right now as part of his supervised release in like a grocery store, convenience store that he's actually like sweep, <laughs> sweeping floors. Um, but in a very regal, you know, in a mob royalty manner. Uh, he holds court there, right? Yeah, that he kind of holds court there, and um, people are coming to pay their respects. And uh, it, it it looks like, you know, the stars have aligned for him again, where, you know, Mazone went away in, in 2000, and around 2002, three-ish, Massimino, I believe, became underboss shortly after Mazone went away, and now Mazone's going away 20 years later, and, and it looks like Massimino's going to uh, come up uh, and take his place in, in the admin. When those guys were back on the street, was he demoted or was he in, was he in prison? Too? He went to prison, okay. which is why he so it kind of resolved itself. gave gave up the underboss position. Yeah, and uh, he is uh, f- from like the Legambi camp. Did not come up uh, around the Merlinos or, or that Merlino group of, of childhood friends that uh, were were all the sons and nephews of, of a lot of the Scarfo era guys. He uh, he came up uh, with Legambi, who I guess was part of the Molino group, but a different yeah. era. He's he's seventy. Uh, Joe Mouse is seventy three right now. Uh, the Molino crew are all just turning 60, yeah. 61. So they're a bit younger. So there's about 12, 13 years difference. And uh, Massimino, Massimino rather was, um, I believe he was made under Stampa. That's interesting. He could have been made in one of the early Natali Molino ceremonies, mm-hmm. but. I think he was made under Stanford. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like culturally, if you look at the, because each Borgata has these sort of cultural idiosyncrasies. I mean, there's certain universal things, right? You, you, you know, if you're made guy, things like that, but the Philly guys seem to really like titles. Yes. And like administrative yes. kind of things, well, don't they? Well, I think one of the things I've heard specifically about Joey Merlino and his leadership style is Joey loves giving out titles. He mm. loves giving out positions. He recognizes that there's currency in that. Yeah. And even if there are a lot of guys, you know, if there are, even if there are more chiefs than Indians, <laughs> right, it, right, it right. benefits him keeping everybody happy. Yeah. Um, making them feel appreciated. And, uh, and, and, and oftentimes switching those roles. Right. On the, on the fly. So a guy could be underboss for a couple of years and then, he can be a cop or maybe even a soldier at some point. But at one point he was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he, he, he was number two. I know I think of Marty Angelini, or Marty Angelina now um, in terms of that, that he became underboss for a while in the 2000s. I think when Joe Mouse had to go serve some prison time and he was just kind of representing the Merlino camp as the number two um, and then fell back. And I, I believe he's a captain now, but uh it's just it's it's interesting how how Joey um, maneuvers and and slots people, but yes, I think that's a very astute observation. So, would you say that he's acting under boss, or do you think he's gonna? This is for the foreseeable future, or you know, well, when Stevie Mazone's got six years to do, right? It's not a short period of time. Dom Grandi's got seven years to do, so. And I also, let me backtrack for a second. My, my sources are saying it's not in stone that he's necessarily going to come back as the underboss, but that he's going to come back into the administration. They're predicting that he'll be coming back into the, uh, coming back into the underboss position. But it's also been floated to me that he could become consigliere and Joe Legambi, who's now the kind of the semi-retired yeah, consigliere, who, who was a mentor to Massimino, could step away into full retirement and go down to Florida or just stay in South Philly and not have to be involved as in, in as much. And that Massimino would become conciliary. Is, 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 um, the Gamby officially the conciliary? Is he sort of like yeah. conciliary emeritus or how would you, I, I think he, I would, again, there's so many titles that yeah. it gets confusing. So I think he is from, from what I can glean. Uh, so he was acting boss. From 2000 to 2020 or 19, whatever year that he had his uh, 80th birthday party. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's 83 now. So that was, I think it was 20 or it might've been 19. Whatever. Regardless. Uh, 
And that was when he officially stepped down as acting boss and went into a semi-retirement while still holding a, concil- a conciliary post. I think he's the official conciliary and there is an acting conciliary that who I, I believe has switched between um, Faffy Anarella and, and, and Joe Scoops, uh, Lakata, New Jersey. And it's kind of like whenever someone needs to troubleshoot, they'll troubleshoot. And if, and if it's Legambi that needs to step in, he'll step in. If it's one of those other two, they'll, they'll do the job. So I think either way, you know, Legambi, he's 83 years old. I don't think he, he wants to keep doing this. Some of it, it's just been, he's been a good company man. Mm-hmm. So you're bringing stability. Yeah. And, and Faffy's one of these Scarfo era guys that did, did 25 years and came out about five years ago and is one of these conduits between the two generations of the, um, the Scarfo era. And then those younger sons and nephews of, of the Scarfo era guys that were basically were errand boys for Faffy. And now those are the guys running the family. And um, Faffy's been seen hanging out a lot more with the younger, well, in, he's in his seventies just like Joe Mouse's uh, and he's hanging a lot with the guys in their fifties and, and, and early sixties. And, and so um, kind of being that again, that, that kind of bridge. Yeah. And he's, he's a trusted uh, a very, his insights very valued and trusted. He's at the clubhouse a lot. And I know he, he's one of those people that acts as a go between for the Merlino Legambi camp. And then there's two other camps out there um, that are underneath the, the Bruno Scarfo banner, old Scarfo era guys that aren't necessarily underneath Joey. I mean, I guess they are. It's very, the, the, yeah. it's, lo- it's a much looser configuration in Philly uh, than I think uh, traditional uh, mob hierarchy would be. But the, the Pungitores and, and, and Phil Narducci, are out there as well, kind of doing their own things. I think Narducci's aligned with the Tenth and O guys, which is an independent, half Irish, half Italian. But there's someone, someone is um, the liaison between Narducci and Joey. Is it? Um, well, I think Mazzone was with Martirano or me, like Mazzone? not a made guy, but isn't there someone who like kind of runs? Um, not interference, not the right way to put it, but. Because, like you well, I said, think Faffy's one of those guys. He's one of those guys that can communicate. And I think Stevie, Stevie was one of those guys too. Okay. That, uh, some of those older Scarfo era members aren't huge fans of the right. way Joey runs the family. Um, I, I think there's some of that dynamic that I mentioned before, where when they were getting their buttons and and coming into their own in the mafia, Joey was just a guy that went and got their dry cleaning. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And and it frankly, caused a lot of trouble when he was a young guy. That these older guys had to go sort out, mm-hmm. fighting in the club, stealing, you know, leveraging who his dad and uh, and cool. his connection to to Nikki Scarfo and whatnot. And I think they have a hard time, kind of like uh, to make another pop culture analogy, but you know, like when uh, Feech came home oh, yeah. or Richie Aprile comes home in the Sopranos and sure. uh, Tony now is, is, is the kingpin. Yeah. And they refer to him as a kid. And yeah, he yeah. Tony doesn't like that. So, uh, I know that Faffy's been one of those guys and, and Stevie Mazzone is one of those guys who, although he is a Joey contemporary, I, I've been told that, that specifically Narducci, um, respects Stevie and, uh, is okay to him business with Stevie. But again, I, it's still, it's like you have three families operating within one organization. Well, it's interesting because, you know, there's a lot we don't know. It's a secret society. And so they don't issue press releases. So we, we do the best we can in terms of <laughs> decoding. And, 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 <laughs> and it should be mentioned that both Phil Narducci and Joey Punge, whether or not they're, I believe they are, but whether or not they are, back fully into organized crime mode or not. They are both very, very successful, legitimate businessmen right now. They're that are making a lot of money legitimately. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, you recording Phil, that. Phil Narducci with his, with his restaurant chicks 
um, which is a nod to his dad, Chicky Narducci. And it's, it, it gets great reviews. And um, he also was invested, I know, into some MMA stuff and some boxing stuff, real estate. And then, and then Joey Punge is, I heard, you know, making millions legitimately in the real estate business. Well, again, each, each um, Borgata has its own idiosyncrasies. And I think one way of thinking about it is if you have a situation where it's more of a confederation and sometimes things are more um, horizontal than we might traditionally think with a Cosa Nostra organization. So if you have this kind of faction who's doing its own thing and then it becomes puzzling because you find out, well, they're, maybe they're not even kicking up. And you think, well, how, how is that possible? Well, that only is an issue if whoever the technical boss is, how far they're willing to go to enforce that. <laughs> and if, and if and Joey, if ain't, Joey ain't going to war I, right, with the pungitors I mean? right, so, or Phil Narducci, whether right. or not they like each other or yeah. not. So you could, if you're a faction, you could test the waters and see. Now there's some guys we know like in New York, it's happened where like, if, if you don't you know kick up, then there's, there's going to be violence. But in some cases, we we know things were murky in Detroit in the 90s with technically Jack Toko was the boss, but we know the Jack Colonies, we know Tony Z. They were doing some stuff. Tony, that Z, was was made, Tony Z was making his own guys. Right. So. Hey, there was some stuff off the books. And again, it only matters if Jack Toko is willing to, how far he's willing to go to enforce that. So sometimes things are murky. I think in both the situations we're talking about, though, when it comes to Jack Toko and the Detroit guys in the 90s and Merlino in the more modern. Philly era, I think they've, meaning Merlino and Toko, have, have made calculated political decisions yeah. as bosses to give that autonomy to these people um, and take a hands off approach and kind of foster an environment where maybe he's not going to be kicked up to. Maybe he's not going to be deferred to, and he's okay with that for the sake of keeping everything copacetic. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting um the and then in terms of street politics because I don't I don't know how that affects those crews that are like semi-independent their interactions with other crime groups or street guys because one of the advantages you have to being a made guy and being part of an Italian Cosa Nostra organization is if someone fucks with you you're fucking with the whole organization. <laughs> now, I don't know now does that change things because um you know, um, if you get um, in some kind of entanglement and then you're going to go to Joey now and say, hey, you know, I'm being fucked with. Well, well you, I would, you can't have it both ways. Either, I would, either you're either you're semi-independent and I leave you alone or. <laughs> well, I would guess that Phil Narducci would never feel like he had to go to Joey for anything. That yeah. he would feel like Joey should come to him. Yeah. Um, I, I think Phil Narducci in some ways is like a a Don in his own right without really being a Don. Yeah. I don't know what we would call him. I would identify him as a capo right now. Um, but he like, he kind of is the rules, the roost of his own side of things there. He's been caught up since he got out of prison. He's been out of, uh, for his big sentence, which was the, the murder racketeering case for the Scarfo era. He did 25 years or whatever. But then since he's been out, uh, he came out in about 10 years ago. He had to go back in for a year or two on a loan shark and extortion case. Well, let, let's, so there may be some circumstances where he could just handle, if there's some kind of issue with some yeah. other criminal group, he can handle it himself, right? He's a tough he's guy. Very, he's and, he's very, and he's very connected. And he's, so, well, that's what I was going to get to. But what happens if there's a discrepancy or disagreement with somebody from a New York family? See, I think Narducci is just as connected into New York he, he, as Merlino and the Gambia. So he wouldn't have to go. Yeah. To, I, well, that's just my, again, that's my reporting, right, my belief. No, no, for sure. Yeah. Um, but, but Narducci made a lot of connections in prison and he made a lot of connections when he was a young mob figure in the eight. I mean, he was doing hits for, for Nikki and, and the chicken man and those guys when he was in his early twenties. Yeah, because an example, a real allegedly world example from that that I'm interested in, because I like the transatlantic Sicilian stuff, is the Cherry Hill Gambinos. When the Cherry Hill Gambinos were operating in Philly and South Jersey, they would have run-ins with Philly guys. But, well, they specifically had a beef with Narducci, right? Right. That Nikki Scarfo had to. That's what I'm saying. So you you had to go to the boss to. Yeah. So so if if hypothetically, let's say 
obviously Scarfo was a different kind of leader. And Scarfo wouldn't tolerate semi-autonomous. I mean, he went yeah. to war with uh, Rickle Beat, right? He would not tolerate that. I understand that. But just for the moment, hypothetical, if Scarfo would have played that game where, like, okay, you're semi-autonomous, then that semi-autonomous crew gets in trouble with the Cherry Hill Gambinos. It might be to your benefit to be able to go to Scarfo. Yeah. Because you can't fucking well, go Scarfo, to war with yeah, the Like Gambinos. you're saying, that, yeah, Scarfo <laughs> wasn't down with the whole uh, but he, autonomy. But he would have tolerated that. Right. Beginners. But just hypothetically. But Bruno was. Yeah. but, but Bruno, the, Bruno let Rick Abini kind of run yeah, his yeah, own the, little the, yeah, that's right. crime family within a crime family. Right, as, long as, as, long as, he saw, as long as you saw a Christmas bonus. But there's, there's certain advantages to being able to go to the familia, yeah. but specifically Narducci, you know, when he was in his tw- when he was in his twenties, got into some type of dispute with one of the Cherry Hill Gambinos, threatened to kill one of them or whatever. I think it was Manny Gambino. Yeah, and Nikki Scarfo had to step in, and there was a sit down, and and this was this was Phil Narducci, the same Phil Narducci now. This was Phil Narducci in his in his twenties back in in the mid eighties. So so it. it it's one thing to have some kind of disagreement with some debtor or some nickel and dime gangster, but if, if you have a dispute with like one of the five families, there may be some advantages to being able to to say we have the whole organization yeah. behind us. But, and then I think it also that makes sense. what has benefited Joey more than Joey Merlino and his crew. What has benefited them more than anything is the fact that Legambi got out of prison in the 90s. He wasn't supposed to. He was supposed to be doing life in prison. He got the murder charge that actually him and Phil Narducci were both charged in, which was the, the Frankie Flowers hit. And Legambi, Legambi came on after that 10. That was another, sorry to interrupt. That was yeah. another guy that Bruno left alone. Who was, in a, who was, all, had, was independent, kind of <laughs> was, was a mob copper without even being a soldier. Right. right. Kind of ran his own little right. part of the family without even being made. Right. And there were there were articles in the Philadelphia newspapers after Bruno died saying that Frankie Flowers could have been boss right. or speculate. I mean, it shows you what kind of yeah. And he, he was he wasn't even a main guy, right? Uh, but Legambi comes out of prison in '97. Uh, he was in there for ten years, and it, it the dividends that it paid I think are still paying off. Where that Legambi can smooth things over for Joey with all those Scarfo era guys because he was a Scarfo yeah. era guy. Yeah, that's good. So point. I'm guessing him being in the mix uh, as the Scarfo era guys filtered out and there was all of that conjecture and speculation 10 years ago um, or 10, 12 years ago that there was going to be a pending war in the right. Philadelphia Mafia with all the eras coming out of prison and they were all going to be on the street and they were all going to be fighting over the same piece and that never happened. And the reason that never happened was because of Joe Legambi. Um, and again, that benefit, and that should have never been. It, you know, if what was supposed to happen in 1987, he, Joe Legambi was never supposed to see the light of day. He might have came out 30 years later, 40 years, but he wasn't yeah. coming on for 10 years. And that really helped Joey. And I think um, it's helped uh, format where we are today with, with the punch tours kind of doing their thing with some of those other Scarfo guys. I think uh, uh, Nikki Whit Milano, another Scarfo era guy is with the punch tours And then Phil Narducci does his own thing with a bunch of guys that I heard he got a couple, he's had some, some of his guys made um, in the last five to 10 years, but uh, he's got a lot of independent guys behind him. A lot of younger guys that didn't want to line up behind Joey. Um, that are lining up behind Phil. And like I said, they're, they're alleged an alliance with the 10th and O guys, which is a, um, a, a group of like a multi-ethnic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're relatively younger guys. They're guys that are now in their, uh, I think the 10th and O has been around for a while, but the guys that are running 10th and O right now are guys that are in their uh, late forties, mid forties. Um, Johnny Garbarino and Jeannie boy Miller, I think are the, are, are the names. But, uh, so let's just go back to Joe Mouse for a second. And I don't know what Mouse's relationship with the Scarfa era guys was other, other than his close relationship with Legambi. Um, so I don't know if, if Joe Mouse knows Phil Narducci or the Punter Tours like well. Uh, I do know that Joe Mouse is a character. And let's kind of just talk about some of, you know, anecdotally, um, again, Someone that is well liked by a lot of people, but scares a lot of people. 
He's got a he's got that good combination right. in the world. Um, he is again just a hardcore gangster. You know, like every the type of guy that like every chromosome in your body, every every parcel of DNA in you is 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 criminal. <laughs> and I don't. And I'm guessing that Joe Miles wouldn't deny that. That, that I think he's kind of proud of that. Frankie ex- the Bomb. Sounds yeah, like a right. Frankie the Bomb. From Detroit, yeah. Kind of proud of that. Um, and that's exemplified by a story we were talking about off uh, off camera that happened when he became underboss in around 02 or 03. He, he was like holding meet and greets and like autograph sessions for his neighborhood um, because he was so proud of the fact that he had reached the administration and they got it, you know, they have wiretaps of one of, uh, one of his buddies call, Hey, you know, junior wants to come and meet the underboss. He's actually saying the underboss and, and, uh, wants to come and shake your hand and, and, and take a selfie. And, uh, and, and Joe mouse was all about it. It, it's it's interesting. Uh, it reminds me of again Frankie the Bomb. So if uh, people should check out Scott's book Motor City Mafia, shameless self yeah. uh, or <laughs> promotion. No, I think yeah, I think the like the, I said, there's the, a there's an analogy because Frank the Bomb, Billy Jackaloni, they remind me of uh, Detroit versions yeah, of Joe Mouse. Unapo- unapologetic. So if if people there's no pretense there. If for Scott's book. There were some people that took exception to being mentioned in Scott's book and even even threatened litigation. And and Frankie the Bomb's attitude was, you're goddamn right I'm in that book. Yeah, yeah. And I should have been in that book. And yeah. let's give props to Bernstein right. for letting everybody know what a big bad gangster I was. Yeah, he was or pretty he was pretty enthusiastic about yeah. about being in your book, where some of the other guys didn't, didn't appreciate it. So it's interesting the different uh the different um psychologies yeah. that well, look, the people well, in that world if, have. If we want to keep on, you know, uh, doing the compare and contrast, a guy like Joe Punge, a guy like Phil Narducci, right now they've at least in terms of what they want their public perception to be, they've reinvented themselves and uh, they want to be known as reform gangsters that are now legitimate businessmen. I don't think Joe mouse has any um, <laughs> visions of, of going, you know, wearing a jacket and tie to work and, and punching a clock. Uh, he has to do this, you know, for supervised release where he's, uh, you know, has a legitimate employment or whatnot. And I know he's always owned bars and, uh, like again, he, just like Legambi, he got he got his start as a bartender, um, so he he came from you know meager beginnings, but uh, you know he's somebody that uh, you know he he was his last jail sentence was a little bit harsher than maybe it should have been, and the judge admitted it because throughout the whole trial he was on trial with Legambi in a in a racketeering case that Legambi beat, but Joe Mouse didn't beat it. And throughout the whole trial, Joe Mouse was being very mouthy mm. and quip in court. Yes, yeah. and quippy and mm. joking a lot. And it's nothing that can upset a judge more than if you're not taking the proceedings in his courtroom seriously. Yeah. And and Joe Mouse was kind of making a little bit of a mockery of things, and he kept on the last couple of days of the uh, of the trial. He kept on telling the media and, and telling the people in the, the courtroom gallery, as well as I think some of the court officers get, get that champagne on ice. You know, we're having a, 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 a victory party in the back of the courtroom. Once the jury comes in and acquits us all, you got who, who what kind of champagne are you buying? It's you like know? a throwback to Al Capone yeah. or something. And he, you know, the verdict came down and Legambi was able to walk um, after two trials there was a mistrial and then he um, was acquitted. But uh, Joe Mouse and, and a guy, Anthony Stano, who was a, a part of that Joe Legambi pecking order, were both convicted. And the judge said at the sentencing with, with Massimino, Joe Mouse, that I'm giving you extra time because of your performance in the courtroom, because of your behavior. Um, That's uh, not to uh, change subjects, but if you've, anyone's following that YSL, uh, trial that they've turned that into the a young circus. thug, the young thug, yeah, uh, black gangsters that they've, they've kind of turned the courtroom into a, a circus. There was actually an exchange or they, they handed the uh, one guy uh, some pain pills, like yeah. right, right during, <laughs> during the proceedings. So yeah, that, that, does, and that in a similar case, the judge is outraged. The judge is 
you're like you're making a mockery of the court kind of thing. So that doesn't usually well, go, go well. Going back to the Frank the Bomb, Billy Jackaloni, my first personal interaction with Billy Jackaloni and Frank the Bomb was at. Billy Jack, or sorry, at Jackie Jackaloni's racketeering trial in 2006 that he was acquitted from. And the jury was coming back to give the verdict. And they didn't know that I was listening, but I was close enough where I could hear the conversation. And this was before Frank the Bomb knew me. I, I got to know Frank the Bomb later. Yeah. And uh, I could hear Billy Jackaloni say to Frank, hey, when the verdict comes in, just stay, keep your mouth shut, be quiet. <laughs> And the verdict came in, and they, they found Jackie not guilty. And Frank stand, God, God, there is a God, yay! You know, like, uh, <laughs> like screaming, you know, victory, like, yeah, you know, basically telling the court to go fuck themselves. Um, and it was just surprise. very loud and, and celebrating uh, Jackie's uh, victory in court, which is somewhat ironic that Jackie would be the one to pull his stripes yeah, when me. Billy when Billy yeah, died. But uh, so, yeah, so kind of like that. And that, that's I guess it's, it's a very apt analogy to, to compare Frank the Bomb and, and Joe Mouse. Uh, but then there also uh, Joe Mouse was caught writing letters in prison oh, yeah. to debtors, sending threatening uh, written letters, but also sending cards like Valentine's Day cards to his debtors with the words like thinking of you, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. That's like, uh, so you I mean, couldn't make that up. Yeah. So this guy's a real character. Um, I, I think that he, he probably, we talked so about, in other words, when he gets out, you're not yeah, off the hook. Right. <laughs> if you owe him money, he's coming to collect. Yes. He's coming home at some point and he's expecting to collect. So I think, um, that, uh, you know, you have a situation here where Joe mouse is one of these guys that we talk about, uh, the you know the triple crown of the mafia, uh, loved, feared, respected. I think uh, Joe Mouse probably comes close to checking all those boxes. Yeah, my understanding is New York guys like him. I, I don't think he's ever been a big earner or anything. Uh, he ran a pretty big book. He was known for being a collector and a good collector and um, someone that uh, I think has respect from multiple generations and, and multiple factions um, within that group. Cause he was able to make the move from the Stampha. Um, he wasn't in Stampha's inner circle, yeah. but he was definitely in the Stampha the organization era. that was deposed by the Merlino organization. Yeah, yeah. And then he was able to violent, kind of uh, slot back. A violent coup. Right. Slot back in there uh, after he did his, I think he did some prison time. If I'm not mistaken um, on the, on the, um, John Stampa, uh 94 Rico case and then had to go back in and do some New Jersey state prison time, which is when he gave up his underbo uh, underboss slot for a couple of years in the 2000s to Marty Angelina. Then he came out, was free for a couple of years and then took the, the most recent uh, Rico case with Legambi, the one that Legambi beat and that he had to go do 12 years for. Now he's out of prison. He's 73 and it looks like he's going to come back into the admin. I would guess underboss. Um, but it's possible that he, he, he could replace Legambia's conciliary. Yeah, well. I see what you mean. 12 years for that kind of uh, charge seems uh, pretty, you know, giving you the, the, the most sentencing you could give someone in that. So let's move now from uh, Joe Mouse to some, some other guys that uh, we're hearing are playing a role in this um, administration shift with Mazzone and, and Dom Grande going to prison. Uh, I don't think it has to be said at this point. If you're watching us, you, you know that Joey Merlino no longer resides in South Philly. He is a resident of South Florida. Since he got out of prison uh, in 2011, he, according to the FBI, according to my sources, he rules uh, via intermediaries and buffers and liaisons and calls shots from afar and kind of does his own thing in Florida. Um, but family had a lot of buffers, Senator. Yeah, a lot of buffers, Senator. <laughs> You know, a guy that, you know, a button, a guy that pushes on, the Sarah, button, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, there, are, there are two guys that are in place right now that I don't think there's any, there's not going to be any movement. Uh, Georgie Borghese, who is Merlino's former consigliere that uh, came out of prison about 10 years ago. My reporting was that he had been demoted 
from a conciliary all the way down to soldier and then worked his way back up from soldier to capo uh, to now where he's uh, uh, acting boss for, for Joey. And uh, he is a, uh, he's an OG. Uh, his, his uncle is Joe Legambi. Uh When he was a, just a teenager, he was hanging around with all those Scarfo guys. And uh, from what I can uh, hear and, and have learned that he, he considers himself a mafia historian mm. and he's someone that ha- has studied a lot of the, the uh, crime family genealogy and the, and the political machinations of both his family and other families that he's kind of a student of the mafia. You know, that, that's an interesting, not to digress too much, but the, you know, doing this field research for a number of years, I, I was surprised at how many guys in the life that I've uh, interacted with that, that are really interested in this it, stuff. But it can go the other way though too. Go, right. Where, they where someone get, that has n- knows shit. nothing about right. the history of their family and doesn't right. care about but, it. And, and those are usually the guys who are like the straight gangster. Yeah. Like, like I, I'm just doing this cause I'm a crook. Right. And I'm not really interested in the, 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 the social history and all that. But some of the guys are, are, yeah. are take it, take a real interest uh, in, in the, the history and, and following stuff like this. So it's pretty. And, and I think George is the type of guy that has always wanted this spot, uh, whether it was the official number one spot or the acting number one spot. Uh, he is the, the last word in Philadelphia day to day in the Bruno Scarfo crime family, based on my reporting. Um, he has a street boss. So there's almost like three bosses. And this goes to your Joey likes giving out roles and positions. There's almost three boss. You don't. You could almost say there are three bosses of the Philadelphia Mafia. Now. You have Joey, who's the official boss. You have Georgie, who's the acting boss, and then you have Mikey Lancelotti, who's the alleged street boss. Well, there's there's some parallels with like the outfit back in the day. It was. I'm not an outfit expert at all, but it's sort of murky about when Ricardo, like he was. The, the real boss, right. but but in some ways he he wasn't because he was he was conciliary. He was and, like conciliary, right. but he was actually the boss. But actually, but so it, sometimes, like yeah. I said, this world can get murky in the political arrangements. It's not always easy. They don't release a an organizational yeah. chart. Oh, I could see a, <laughs> like situ- a corporation. I could see a situation where Mikey Lancelotti gets named underboss, so he's like street boss underboss, and Joe Mouse becomes conciliary. Yeah, um, but. So right now, the the two top spots that were uh, firmed up before any of the, uh, of the of these um, legal cases that had to be uh, resolved, and then sending some some of the the core guys to prison. Uh, before that, uh, Georgie Borghese was acting boss. Mikey Lance was street boss, and after that, I, that that part of the Philly hierarchy is not changing, but. Someone is having to replace Stevie Mazzone, who was the number two guy. Um, and someone's going to have to replace Dom Grande. Who, he was a captain, right? Who was a capo, and it was kind of a street boss in training. So Wouldn't one of his guys just bump up? So, okay, so this somebody is, in his crew? Yeah, so what I'm hearing is Joey Merlino's brother-in-law a guy who we should point out does not have a federal criminal record, um, but is pretty juiced in, uh, not just in South Philly, but uh, in New York City with multiple, allegedly, multiple crime families and multiple mob shot callers. Uh, His name is uh, Joey Bonfiglio. Uh, He goes by the nickname Joey B., and uh, I've been told that he is, I don't, and let me back up. I don't know if this guy's made. I don't know what role he exactly has in the mob. I know that 10 years ago he married Joey's sister um, and was not a South Philly guy. He is a, a Queens guy who grew up around the Gotties. Uh, I heard he was running errands for Junior Gotti back in the 90s. Uh, was very close or is very close to Queens Capo in the Gambinos known, known as uh, Tommy the Monk Sassano. And that he's also very close to the Basciano family um, of the Bonanno royal family. And, and that Vinny, some of Vin, the Vinny Basciano's sons are, are very close to this Joey B. And Joey B was 
down in South Florida, living with skinny Joey Merlino's sister, married his sister. And then at some point in the last couple of years, I'm, I'm guessing during the pandemic, uh, Natalie Merlino and Joey B moved to South Philly. Mm. And I'm being told that in the last couple of years, Joey B is handling Merlino business in South Philly. And that Joey B, when he first got to South Philly, was spending quite a bit of time with Joe Legambi and Mikey Cangolini. Sorry, Johnny Cangolini. So, I'm sorry. Why, why are we talking about this? Why, because <laughs> why are we? What? What? Is because he, he he's replacing Dom Grant. Oh, okay. okay. Now, so, whether or not uh, whether or not I he see. has an official title as a capo, whether or not he's been made, I don't know, but, and I, but I'm his not going to speculate. Is be, uh, but his, from what I understand, I his role right now is a little bit like the Dom Grande role, where he's this. Uh, he's younger than Dom Grande. He's only 38 or 39. Um, and that he is in the inner circle now in the, it, it, within the administration. Now, I don't know if that means he's a part of the administration or he's being used as an instrument of the administration, but, uh, he is a guy that I believe is filling some of the void. Uh, and I think there's another thing at play there, which is the New York connection with the Bruno Scarfo clan. It had been traditionally uh, the Gambinos that had always been tied to Bruno. Uh, and then the Genovese, uh, when, when Ralph Natale took over, he was getting support from the Colombos and the Lucchese's. Merlino, when he first, or Mer, through Merlino's reign, he's had a lot of strong connections with Genovese and Lucchese, but it looks like over the last five to five years, let's say, that the conduit now for the Philly Mafia to the bosses in New York is going through the Gambinos now again, mm. and is no longer going through the Genovese That's interesting. or the uh, Lucchese. And some of that has to do with the fact that Patsy Perello, who was their Genovese guy, went to prison. Uh, little Joe Perna who was their Lucchese guy, had to go to prison and they needed to fill that void. And I, from what I'm told, they used Joey's brother-in-law, Joey B, and his connections to the, the Gambino, the Queens crew in Gambino, um, in the Gambino family, to build that bridge to the, to the five families again or to replace how they were using the Lucchese's and the Genovese uh, through Perello and Perna, that they're now using the, the Queen's Gambino crew, uh, Tommy the Monk Sassano. Well, and Stanfa was a Gambino guy, so you're right. right it, it's kind of uh, rotated right. right back and forth. But again, I want to be very clear. Uh, Joey B does not have a, a federal, um, and he doesn't have any federal criminal record. Um, I think he has some, some minor uh, New York State things when he was younger. And I do not know, and I'm not reporting that he is a made guy. I'm not reporting that he's a capo. Um, I don't know. I just know that he has been inserted into a group of people uh, at, at least at face. He's spending a lot of time with the guys that are running the show in, in Philly. And I'm hearing that he's representing uh, Joey's interest in, in Philly with Joey being down to Florida. How does that play politically? Um, if let's say if some guy, maybe not this, but just any any example, a guy is a captain, powerful captain. He goes away, and instead of promoting from within, you insert some other guy and say, because I know this is make believe and not real, but the Sopranos. This happened with uh, the uh, when Ralphie was one of Richie's guys. He's expecting to be bumped up once Richie goes into witness protection, right? Um, and uh, Tony doesn't do that, right? right? He puts in a different guy for his own political right. reasons he, he, because he doesn't want the uh, Priel crew to be, be too powerful. Uh, that didn't go over well. Now, I know that's make-believe, but, there, but there's a lot of politics in the underworld, and, yeah. and that can happen when and, guys resent being stepped over. Well, there's also, I think, I don't want to overstate this, but I know there's a sentiment on, on the streets of South Philly that Joey's getting the best of both worlds right now. 
he's not in he's not in the trenches. He's out in Florida. He's getting a piece of what everybody does there. Um, but he's getting that piece without the same skin in the game, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Joey would argue, I'm sure. Hey, motherfucker. Hey, motherfucker. I've got enough skin in this game yeah. for all of you guys right. that I put in. Just look at the prison. Team. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and I put this whole thing together so I can run this thing any yeah. way I fucking you want know who to. put this together? Right. Me. Right. That's who. So, uh. You know the reference, Benny? From, from Scarface. Scarface. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know who I trust? Me. me. That's who. <laughs> uh, so. And then he's out in Florida. The belief is that he's doing a lot of his own things there. And there aren't, there isn't anybody that gets to share in that. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in theory, there could be resentment. But again, what I'm hearing is that making another analogy to Dom Grande, Dom Grande was, was thought of incredibly highly from the time he was in his 20s. People were looking at Dom Grande and say, this guy has all the intangibles all the x factors all of the the things that you need to be a great mob guy to be a great mob leader and and they groomed him and i think with joey b and not just i don't know what's going on right now but what i've heard is that everybody that's of the older generation looks at joey b as someone that's wise beyond his years somebody that is in his 30s but acts like he's been in uh, in that world for, for 30 years, that he is a stickler for the rules, that he's somebody that, again, is very well connected, is connected to bosses and multiple families. Um, I believe there, there is a picture somewhere on social media of, of Joey B visiting Vinny Basciano uh, in prison. Wow. Um, and there are a number of photos of him on social media with Tommy the Monk Sassano and in some of those photos, it's hashtag with like rising mob superstar or uh, you know mob up and comer. So it's it's hashtag not, by who, like, whoever's posting the social media photos. Oh. So I, I I wish I could tell you who those people were. Yeah, but I just saw the posts, and uh, so I'm not. A, that's why I'm not necessarily afraid to talk about it because yeah. it's kind of out there already, and I've written about it and haven't really gotten any blowback on it. So again, I just always want to be very clear. And Mikey, and by the way, Mikey Lancelotti is another guy. He doesn't have a, a, any federal convictions. He's been arrested, um, but never convicted. You know, the thing with Joey, though, in Florida, um, again, there's precedent for that's one of the privileges that goes with lasting and being the boss. We mentioned Tony Accardo already going out to California. Is it really from Detroit going down to Florida? And there, and there are other examples of guys who, um, if you're the boss and you've put in your time, that uh, you have, you can enjoy this kind of role where you're insulated, where you can go semi-retired somewhere. You're still, for all intent and purpose, the boss. But you've removed yourself from the day to day operation. Just being smart. Yeah, I mean, and there's it's it's I can I, I can see why some guys on the street might resent that. I'm just saying he's not the first. But Joey's the, not the, the first. The 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 kind of unicorn factor here, though, with with Joey with Joey and his group, we've talked about this quite a few times. Is this this loyalty that transcends the mob? These guys love Joey like he's a brother. And it really has nothing to do with an oath they took to the Bruno Scarfo crime, crime family. It's an oath that they took to each other when they were in the sandbox when they were six or seven years old. They're gonna, you're going to see the comments. Right. <laughs> People love Scott's when analogy they, about it, the sandbox. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, just, I know I'm, I'm being hyperbolic. I'm just saying that these guys have been friends since yeah. elementary school, junior high school, and that means more. <laughs> they, you'll see it's, it's true. I mean, it's true. Scott loves the sandbox okay, analogy. Well. With, it's not the first time he's it's okay. I'm breaking balls. Uh, it's, it's, not, right. it's not his first time you using can the break analogy. My balls. But uh, no, but the point is well taken that that can kind of, I think this is your point, correct if, I, if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it can diffuse some of those resentments that might exist in other circumstances because they have a different right. bond. Yeah. And don't, right? that's and, not underworld and, 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 and if, not, not organizational. Right. And if you've studied the history of this group, 
this group has it's, it hasn't been all har- harmony <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and and uh, puppy dogs and rainbows. <laughs> There's been some serious issues within this group that they worked out amongst themselves. Yeah, and it never the dirty laundry never really got aired. At least you know in, in federal court documents. Right. Um, you know, you had a situation where I've written about this. I'm not afraid to talk about it, where Georgie and Marty wanted to kill each other. Um, when they came out of prison because Georgie felt that Marty was, uh, taking advantage of when Georgie was in prison, but they worked it out. They actually got into a room and I heard there was uh, an airing of the grievances, if you will. (laughs) And, uh, they both got past it. And, uh, so if there was any opportunities to, for these guys to turn on each other, they would have, they've all, there's been, there's been so many of them. Yeah. Um, so there, there's that factor, but, um, you know, you have a situation where you heard it in, in the wiretaps that were played in this lat or that were available in this last bus that took down Stevie Mazzone and Don Grande. Mazzone's on tape telling the, the new initiates, Hey man, meaning me. We shed blood for this thing. I mean, I'm paraphr- yeah. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. But you know, we shed blood for this thing, and now it's our thing, and we ain't giving it away to any suckers. Yeah, I that remember that. That was kind that. of exactly yeah. what yeah, he remember, said. Yeah, I remember that. Like yeah. basically, like, we went to war for this family. Yeah. We spent almost a decade at war. Uh, Prison time. Yeah, and, and now you know, now it's it's ours for the plundering, and and we're taking it all. And then that was yeah. also the speech where he talked about going back into Atlantic City and and planting the flag again. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, the, it's, it's, it's something of note to talk about maybe some lingering animosities about how things are being run and the boss not being an, you know, an absentee boss or whatever. But I, I think it's just, it's normal organizational gossip, uh, and, and organizational, um, complaints that are just you know probably in any office where people talk and people complain but it's never going to reach a point of uh, upheaval but those personal connections can stabilize a situation so in this case the personal connections are there they grew up with each other are friendly with each other in detroit i know i'm like the analogy king today but in detroit it was they're all related to each other yeah <laughs> that that helped diffuse anytime there were because right. they're same thing there were tensions yeah. guys that like and there each was other. that but, but that would kind of Diffuse right. like any kind of anything blowing up because they were related to each there other. There was a famous quote in, in the wiretaps from the Detroit case in 96, where I, I believe it was Nove Toko talking about his uncle and Jack Toko saying, Yeah, in any other family, these guys would be killing each other by now, right. but my uncle doesn't want to uh, go into retirement having all of his family members <laughs> shooting at each other on the street, right? Yeah, because they would go to the same yeah. birthday yeah. parties right. and holiday parties. So, the, la- yeah. the, the last person I want to mention in this episode, and uh, we'll finish up in the next five. Five, five, ten minutes. Uh, Damien Canalicchio, who was a guy that I think you should keep your eye out for uh, in the in the Philly family right now. He's recently come out of prison the last couple of years. He was Steve Stevie Mazzone's, one of Stevie Mazzone's protégés, uh, came up through the ranks in the 90s as Stevie's bodyguard and driver. Uh, and he went to prison, I'm pretty sure, on that same Legambi Massimino case. Uh, and did, uh, I don't know. I think it was eight years, eight, nine years. He's out now. I- I've heard that there were opportunities for him to become a capo. Uh, I would guess my best guess is that he has become a capo. I don't have any confirmation on that, but I believe that Damien will be somebody that is playing a role in filling the Stevie void. Um, that he's somebody that Stevie trusts. Well, that would make that would make sense to that tradi- more traditional arrangement where yeah. one of the guys who was under right. you kind of bumps up. Right. And uh, Damien is another one of these guys that uh, very well liked. People trust him um, and people are afraid of him. <laughs> he, he's got a, a reputation. He's never been... Uh, convicted or arrested in any gangland slains, but there, uh, there is the belief by the FBI that he, that he is suspected of playing a role in a couple, uh, hits back in the early two thousands that they've never been able to charge. Um, so that's always kind of been hanging over his head. 
And uh, but he he is rock solid, both uh, you know figuratively and literally. If you've seen the guy since he's come out of prison, he kind of went into prison a little little doughy, um, and now he's chiseled and and uh, looks like he put on about thirty pounds of muscle. And again, he's come out and um, he he has a lot of a, a lot of goodwill. And a lot of, uh, I would, I would call it, you know, capital, I guess, mob capital in, 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 um, in terms of currency with his reputation and whatnot. Uh, well, I, I had a good time. This was a good episode. Yeah. Just to remind everyone, uh, please again, follow us, subscribe, and, uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Scott Bernstein, Jimmy, we're out. We're out.